Here we are, another title written a year ago that turns out now to be timely. Or does it? Does tonight's lecture come in the middle of far too much of the same? Public debate on the referendum to come in June turns regularly to, and turns regularly on, human rights. In the post-referendum analysis, if the result is close, human rights may be seen as a significant or even possibly the determining factor. So how is the debate dealing with that and with other issues? The referendum will, once it's over, raise issues about open democracy, including whether, with politicians seen so often to be flawed, all importance should be dealt with, or it may be said, or all issues should be dealt with by referenda, something that must soon be easy to achieve with internet voting. Will this referendum take us and other countries to versions of the Swiss system of direct democracy adjusted for countries larger than Switzerland? Or will exactly the opposite happen? And a referenda be avoided in recognition of many political problems being far too complicated for the ordinary voter and best left to the politicians we elect, who must become worthy of our respect in deciding such problems. This second alternative raises a question not proper to voice, but I must. Are some issues so technically difficult as to be inappropriate for some, at least, of our citizens to vote on? Should the universal franchise be limited? Should there perhaps be specialist voter panels for highly sophisticated referenda issues if referenda are to be held? In Switzerland, frequent referendums on proposed laws do influence the way both Parliament and Government act, but within a somewhat complex process that incorporates a formalised method of opinion polling before the date uh, of a proposed change is even sent to Parliament. Now, that's it. Um, wer nem lassungs wer fahren? But maybe the alternative is a little easier to read, procedure to hear opinions. This is said to be responsive to the reality that even the most sophisticated system of proportional election voting cannot guarantee that the opinions of the members of parliament are a true representation of people's opinion <coughs> on the po possible political question going possibly to a referendum. So this procedure to hear opinions gives possibility for a broad spectrum of political parties, of professional and cultural organisations, to put forward their wishes and views and to state really where the limits may be of whether you have a referendum or not. And thus, this is a mechanism, and there can of course be many others, of achieving compromise without a referendum. Such reforms moving towards a regular referenda are not for us now, if ever. But being honest about how much of the highly technical, political, economic, cultural, legal issues that will fall for consideration in this referendum and how they may be beyond most of us to deal with competently raises another question. How are those voters less interested in detail or even simply less educated being addressed? How will they make up their minds? It's easy to say that they're being subjected to simple-minded xenophobic express, excess by the tabloid and other Brexit-inclined press, and so they may be. But even they have had vulnerability to this excess limited by the public discussion to date. And let me give you an example, and you can be honest with yourselves on this. Until a year or so ago, the easygoing public house conversation would have had it that the UN was simply a subject of human rights imposed from Europe. <laughs> Mine's a pint. That's a nice thought. But, <clears throat> but the, debate, the, the debate in the heavyweight press has slowly acquainted its readers and viewers with the fact of which I wonder if you were all aware with the fact that the Council of Europe is not the EU, 
that it was the Council of Europe that established the European Court of Human Rights, that the European Convention on Human Rights was drafted substantially by United Kingdom uh, politicians after the Second World War and right-wing conservatives at that. And even if this detail, this material detail, is not recognised by all sectors of society, those campaigning heavily to exit the European Union, no, they can't really allow for that simple own goal of overstating their case and overstating a historical and present reality and a diatribe against Europe. So maybe some of the worst excesses of arguments are being eliminated in a long public debate. And maybe voters of all interests and education will have enough information for the voting decision they must make. We hope so. We have no choice. The decision is ours. The consequences of the referendum are not, I fear, just limited to being in or out of Europe. And they are to be contrasted with the decision to stay in Europe that came in 1975 in the first of only two uh, UK-wide referenda to date, the second one being the alternative vote referendum of 2011. That 1975 referendum under a Labour government followed entry into the EEC precursor of the Union made by the Conservative government of then unpopular Edward Heath. Strong opinions on all sides led to Prime Minister, Labour Prime Minister Harold Wilson allowing Cabinet Ministers to campaign freely as under the present Cameron government and the result was strongly in favour of staying in, 67% on a 65% turnout. And although England was enthusiastic as a whole, um, more enthusiastic as a whole than Scotland or Northern Ireland, there was only two counties, interestingly Shetland and the Western Isles, where the voters as a majority voted uh, not to stay in. And what may be more important is that the changes that followed, backed by this significant majority, were inevitably gradual and heated divisions of the time of the referendum could cool to manageable differences of opinion. Now, Dennis McShane, a famous um, former Labour MP and former Europe minister, has recently, with a good international background and understanding of these things, has written a paper where he contrasts the present position with 1995. And you can see the detail in the handout. By the way, the handout is not the one that will be on the website. For any reference purposes, go to the corrected version on the website. The one you're taking out tonight's uh, flawed in some ways or needs needed improvement. So he makes a number of points of difference which are really significant. That we'd only been in the EEC for two years Few voters were aware of any change. The press was overwhelmingly in favour. The Confederation of British Industry was in favour. The referendum was at the beginning of a Labour government which was now popular because the previous one had been so unpopular. The Tory leadership, including Margaret Thatcher, were strongly supportive. There was cross-party support with all the big figures in the Labour Party supporting it. And although people were allowed to speak out against it, there was only one MP in the Cabinet who spoke against it much or at all, and you can all guess who he was. One voice, please. Tony Benn. Well done. Uh, um, the Liberals, who were then still a respectable party, I, I can say that because I've been one myself, um, and they had popular lead leaders, they were in favour. Um, and... So that it's very different from the present position, whereas Den uh, Dennis McShane puts it, wannabe Cameron successors uh, are all themselves natural Eurosceptics. Uh, the majority of the, Labour of the Conservative Party is thought to be Eurosceptic, and therefore there's a temptation, says McShane, for top Tories to go for a Brexit in order to become champions of the Tories. In 1975, there were no limits on campaign financing and the in-camp outspent the outcome. Uh, says McShane, the Scottish referendum is no necessary guarantee of the way ahead or forecast for the future. The differences are between a hundred years old marriage, he says, and a 48-year long cohabitation where the cohabitees have got fed up with each other. 
So it's quite a good analysis of the differences, and we should have it in mind. And his sobering analysis nevertheless fails to deal with consequences beyond the economic or political. If the result of the referendum is to stay in, the grumbling and division will continue until and unless the UK takes a lead in Europe and makes its workings more acceptable to all, or unless the economic benefits of continued membership become obvious so that sceptical opinions can be swamped by consumer contentment. Or perhaps, I suppose, until a really horrible armed conflict reveals the security advantages of having a leading role in a large political entity. But supposing the vote is to leave, uh, not to be followed by peaceful acceptance that followed the 1975 referendum that lasted until calls for dissent emerged, but maybe by immediate problems that will persist, currency collapse, house market collapse, or perhaps in London, house market escalation, as oligarchs with their Fonseca funds or whatever they are, decided that buying yet another luxury house in a holiday camp city is quite a good idea. Um, <clears throat> so um, reduced employment. Scottish separation and its joining Europe, reduced power in Europe and in the Northern Hemisphere, perhaps loss of our seat at the United Nations Security Council, and so on. What then of our nation family? None of these outcomes is certain. No outcome is known. But all of these are possible. What will voters who went one way say of those who went the other? Where will we, will we as the nation, be able to pull together? And I'm not sure we will. The public house conversation might now include recrimination as inners blame outers, or possibly, I suppose, the other way around. And if one part of the effect of voting out and getting out is to reinforce xenophobic aversion to foreigners, and it may well do, if we are not able to have our holidays with foreigners quite so easily because of visa and financial things, what may happen to our approach to internal within the country integration. A sensitive topic, never far from the problematic. Should we, the public, really ever have been asked to deal with this? The reality, whichever side wins, is that this is a problem for the nation, but that the nation cannot properly solve because there is no consensus. Without consensus, it is change itself, either from in to out or from out to in, as it might have been, that should be avoided. And that's for the same reason, maybe, that the Swiss direct democracy moves by stages to avoid punishing referenda, as I understand it. But it's certainly for the same reason that many countries like the United States that have written constitutions require substantial majorities in their parliaments or their congresses or whatever for changes in the constitution. Here we are running the risk of a Massive change on 51, 49. 50 and a half, 49 and a half. It was perhaps foolish party politics of a party incapable of unity on this topic that led to a promise that should not have been made if the interests of the people and not of one party were to be paramount, but they weren't. Fear of UKIP, an overwhelming desire to win a general election, played their parts in calling for a decision by the electorate insufficiently equipped to handle the confusing material laid before us, so that chance may decide what can't properly be achieved by arguments that may never themselves be sufficiently informed and that may, regularly enough, be bigoted. If we the people have to decide, if we are to be like cabinet ministers, then we need proper briefing papers of the kind they would have, or they might have on certain topics, and of course, even those briefing papers might allow more than one possibility. Well, now, Minister, we calculate it'll cost X million pounds. There is another version that suggests Z million pounds, but we advise you to make your decision on the sensible median position of Y million pounds. Or it might be... Um, uh, it, it, or it might be, for example, that this proposed Minister will probably work for a significant percentage of the case. This new regime at the borders, Minister, will enable us to restrain 10,000 illegal immigrants per year. Now, 
with briefing papers of that level of certainty, a minister makes up his mind. Instead, what have you and I all been having? Oh, the NHS will sink. Oh, no, it won't. It'll swim. Uh, businesses will leave London. Oh, no, they won't. They'll stay. There will be lots and lots of unemployment. No, there won't. There will be more unemployment. Or less. Or whatever I said. Uh, why are our politicians not capable of presenting clear facts for us to decide on? Because that's not what they really seek. For them, not only for one tousled blonde, and you'll remember that English statutes have, for the male, read also the female, so for the female, tousled blonde, read also the male. Um, if you haven't got there yet. Um, <coughs> Playing on our anxieties, on, on the difficulty of our making a decision, may allow them to ascend the greasy pole to leadership of the country, far more important for an individual politician than good governance. Now, why don't you think of your own analogy, but how about this? You have an infected leg. You go to the surgeon for advice on whether to have it cut off. You're presented with two or three surgeons giving different advice and quite unable to agree on any of the underlying facts about the disease, about the vitality of the arteries, or about the nerves. Well, thanks very much, Doc, or rather, Docs. I'll toss a coin, and here's the saw. And into this exciting discussion, the human rights dilemma, if it is, is thrown to help or to confuse, about as relevant to the central issues you may think as those doctors looking at your leg saying, well, now, while you're deciding about the sore on the leg, we have a few rather different ENT specialists over here who are going to advise you about whether you should have your tonsils out. But I have to warn you in advance that not one of them is going to tell you the same thing. Hmm. This is not a democracy functioning in a way to impress others. How is it viewed by others? Well, unsurprisingly, it will be boring having to read from notes, but I have to do it in order to keep time. And then I always lose my place in the notes. Never mind. Um, how are we viewed by others? others. Well, unsurprisingly, this phrase has come out, perfidious Albion, treacherous England, particularly famous in the 18th century, but it actually goes back to the 13th century, where a French bishop spoke of England, oh treacherous England, that the ramparts of her seas made inaccessible to the Romans. Now, most recently, the phrase has been used by the French. And perhaps you won't be surprised to know that although all countries in Europe more or less favour our staying in, the French are the least enthusiastic. It's just marginal. Other countries like Spain are much more keen. And if our voters want our country to be regarded as different from those of mainland Europe, will it be for this epithet? perfidious Albion, treacherous England. M may it be that perfidy led us to great things, something it did as a colonising power. May it do so again. Or may this one perfidious act be too many and we will pay a terrible price. This description, now used by the French, is not something of which we should be proud. It reflects how we voluntarily joined an organisation, call it a club, many people do, knowing that there would be duties and benefits and that there would be rules. It seems clear that we have a potential leadership role in the club and that many other club members do want us to remain and probably to take a lead in the club's affairs. We could stay in, determined to improve the club. Instead, we look for all ways in which the club is not to our liking and invite our own islanders to decide on pulling out and giving club membership altogether, giving up club membership altogether. So what are the sources of human rights law that affect us? Well, there's our own 
Human Rights Act of 1998 that incorporated equivalent European human rights laws that thus made reference to Europe much less necessary or possible. And it's a, a law you may be interested to know that's regarded as setting the way for other countries. As to existing overseas sources of law, there are two, really, in Europe. There's the European Convention on Human Rights and there's European Union law itself. When we joined the European Economic Community, we'd already shown understanding through our participation in the Council of Europe and signing of the Convention after the Second World War, we'd already shown our understanding of the value of pooling knowledge and experience in the law in order to identify and preserve for our citizens and for others in Europe who had been ident what had been identified as universal human rights, rights that cross national borders and demand recognition and respect in all lands. By joining the EEC and the EU, we as a country took part in a more formal system where, so far as human rights laws are concerned, they were given statutory force. Now, some might find it un unsurprising to discover benefits coming from experts of different countries pooling their expertise, and in this case, the law. And it might be unsurprising if the product of shared expertise is not disturbing at first to some. We don't like to be, have our shortcomings drawn to our attention. It's all a bit uncomfortable. Maybe good for us, but we don't like it. And in any event, where you're pooling knowledge and you're trying things out, you won't necessarily get the right answer first time. That doesn't mean to say it's not a good idea to keep trying. However, reactions by several countries, and not just the United Kingdom, to the best efforts of the Strasbourg uh, Court of uh, human rights have been extreme. Sir Nicholas Bratzer, an English judge or an English lawyer, a uh, gentle man of great intellect and the politest person you could possibly meet in my experience, was president of that court in 2011 and 12. And in an article which I'm going to invite you, if you take the hand out and do any further work, to read in full, because it's an excellent article, he said a number of things. He explained with some shock how cases that shouldn't be surprising were whipping up storms. And eventually in this article he says, the vitriolic, and I am afraid to say xenophobic fury directed at the judges of my court is unprecedented in my experience. As somebody who's been involved in the convention system, that's the human rights system, uh, for 40 years. So here you have a serious, uh, a serious lawyer running a serious court that's doing its best, sensing not intellectual judgment or critical appraisal, but naked fury and xenophobia. This was in 2011. And perhaps that's a reality that's in us that we've got to confront as we've now got to decide whether to yield to it or to allow others to yield to it or to encourage others to yield to it or to think of something different. Now, we need to know a bit in order to deal with the problem of, that's going to beset us at the um, referendum. And it's a little knowledge we have. Is that dangerous? Little knowledge sometimes is, or is it essential? Um, you may care to ask yourselves, as I run through this little bit of knowledge, how much you knew, how much the average citizens knew, even how much the average MP knew. <coughs> You can ask people various questions, impertinent though they may be, the answers to which may add to the mystery of how we were ever allowed to deal with this issue by way of a referendum. Of those two European sources, as you understand, the um, human rights law of the Convention and then the European Union's own law in its own court, um, the, the Convention was created by the Council of Europe, as I've said, in 1950 and entered into force in 1953 with its Strasbourg Court established in 1959. And there is no proposal that even with departure from uh, the EU that we will necessarily seek to withdraw from that Convention, really, how could we? Decisions of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg are binding on member states, but the court has no enforcement powers. 
States generally comply, but they don't always do so. And you, those of you at an earlier lecture will remember that the prisoners' voting rights, should they have rights or no rights, is one issue that was an impasse yet to be resolved. Even less known by the public, maybe by your good selves, as I might say, is that contained within the Council of Europe's human rights decision-making process is something called the margin of, who knows, just check you out. Well done. What percentage was that of people who knew? A couple. The rest of you didn't know about it, did you? Are you going to be honest? Fine. I just thought I should check. There it is. It's a sort of French word, really. Another, re another reason for being doubtful about it. Oh, no, don't say that. <laughs> More helpfully translated as the margin of assessment appraisal or estimation. And broadly speaking, it refers to the room for manoeuvre that this dangerous foreign court has uh, because it's prepared to accord national authorities this margin of appreciation in fulfilling their obligations under the convention. The term is not in the convention itself. And I thought you might be interested to ha have a couple of examples of how this margin of appreciation actually works in a couple of quite famous cases. In 1981, there was a case called Dudgeon. And uh, Dudgeon was complaining that the Northern Irish law, which criminalised homosexual activities between consenting adults, breached his Article 8 rights for respect for private and family life. And the court held in that case that, yes, there was a breach of his Article 8 rights, but it accepted, as a matter of fact, that there was widespread um, moral objection in Northern Ireland to proposals that they should follow the United Kingdom in decriminalising um, homosexual acts between consenting males. Um, but finding the breach... Um, and finding that there was this strong, specifically Northern Irish um, issue or position uh, needed to be resolved. And the court resolved it in favour of Dudgeon. And uh, you can read a slightly longer summary of, it, summary of it in the handout. But what it eventually decided was that there must exist in something as private and intimate as the matter with which Dudgeon was himself concerned, there must exist particularly serious reasons before interference on the part of the public authorities can be legitimate if Article 8 is breached. Such justifications as there were for criminalisation, principally the moral conservatism of Northern Irish society, were outweighed by the detrimental effects with the very existence, which the very existence of the law could have on private lives of gay adult males. Now, the fact that better understanding and increased tolerance had resulted in decriminalization in other member states was something that couldn't be overlooked either. Now, who would these days say the court was wrong in inching towards this greater tolerance? Not at all, it was right by almost everybody's standards. And it shows that the process of an external party looking at something and considering it from various points of view can lead to a result that in this particular case many people, perhaps a majority, would say was absolutely right. Another case was Brannigan and McBride, which went the other way. Um, this was in 1993, and, the, and it concerned people who were detained under the United Kingdom's anti-terrorist legislation for excessive periods of time. And they complained that their rights under Article 5.3 uh, to be brought promptly before a judge had been violated. Now, the United Kingdom had filed a derogation in 1988 in respect of the um, uh, terrorist threat that it felt that it was under. And the European Court weighed all this up. Was this a breach that... it? should have to find as a breach? Or was it something that it could say was in fact within the margin of appreciation of this particular country given that we did face the particular threat that gave rise to that particularly fierce legislation? And the nation won, as it were, if you have to see it in terms of win or lose. The margin of appreciation was allowed to make legal or leave as legal that which had been challenged. More recently, there's um, 
a case about Article 3 of the European Convention, which prohibits torture. And this was a case brought by somebody called Winter and others, and it concerned whole life sentences for grave crimes. You may know there's an issue. Can you really send someone to prison, literally for life, never come uh, for consideration for release? And the upshot of that case is interesting because uh, the court found, no, you can't. The European court said, no, you can't send someone away absolutely for life with no chance of his ever being considered uh, again for release into society. You, you've got to do something. But they didn't say you've got to do necessarily that much because what they decided was that there had to be a reg regime whereby some review at some stage would happen for the person who was going to be incarcerated. And they said, providing something really happens by 25 years and providing there's a review thereafter, then this particular uh, article will not have been breached. Do you find that completely wrong? Is that an imposition of really wholly unacceptable law from outside on our funny little island? Do these cases, let me come back to the Conservative Party, do these cases cause in you the sickness that David Cameron feels, so he says, when he thinks of prisoners being allowed to vote? Well, I'm not quite sure why he, it makes him sick. What did the Bullingdon Club, they used to go around beating up each other's rooms, didn't they, I think? Creating mayhem on the streets of Oxford. Oh, I shouldn't remember that. But <clears throat> being entirely unsympathetic to being a prisoner is perhaps to show a lack of understanding of how the other half live, or third, or whatever it is. Now, as the Brexit debate continues, if it does, and if you find yourself discussing in rational terms uh, the, the problem with a determined outer feel free to ask her or him about the margin of appreciation. <laughs> Leaving the, the EU would make no difference to the Convention. What it would mean is that the United Kingdom would not be covered by the other influential law, European Union human rights laws, that are contained in the Union's Charter of Fundamental Rights, which was ratified in the... Treaty of Lisbon, or at the time of the Treaty of Lisbon. And these rights have not so far had such a great impact, but they are actually very wide-ranging. They cover things from uh, human dignity, right to life, prohibition of slavery, right to liberty, security protection of personal data, right to education. The, Euro the United Kingdom achieved a considerable opt-out, according to Protocol 1. I think I may have put this up here. Yeah, I know that's Protocol 30. Protocol 1, um, where certain laws and regulations that may be contrary to the charter of the European Union and nevertheless um, not things that can be struck down or not uh, alleged breaches that can be taken by the citizen to the court. You'll understand that until the Human Rights Act, that both the, the, the citizen and the organisations and states could take issues direct to the European Court of Human Rights in, 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 in many cases. That's why they got such a long backlog of cases to deal with. Back to the European Union and its Human Rights Charter, um, the important power of the European Union Charter laws is that if in breach of those laws, then the laws can be struck down. There is the power really of enforcement which doesn't exist in the Convention because in the case of the Convention all that a judge can do is find um, incompatibility and then wait for a long process of compromise where things are normally sorted out. There is this other additional protocol. Again, you might want to discuss this with your uh, regular outers if you find them. There's something called Protocol 30 which w it was thought might have given two countries, England and Poland, who opted for it or drafted it, because it says about the Charter, the European Charter, doesn't extend to the ability of the Court of Justice of the European Union or to any court or tribunal of Poland or of the United Kingdom to find that the laws 
administrative provisions, practices, or actions of Poland or the United Kingdom are inconsistent with the fundamental rights. That's a bit of a mouthful. But what it's, it's a buyer, it's, a, it's an opt-out. And there was another opt-out in Article 1.2. But in fact, this opt-out, which uh, was perhaps controversial, is not thought to be of much effect. Academics take the view that it's a very limited effect. And I think one of the advocate generals um, uh, in the court itself has said that it's pretty well of no effect. So bear in mind, in fairness of the debate, that as the European Union laws of the Charter become more powerful or more effective, there's a big overlap with the um, uh, convention rights uh, but as the European Union's charter laws become more effective and more experienced, they do have the power to strike laws down uh, and they have the powers thus of enforcement. Now, it's perhaps worth thinking just briefly about one example of the sort of case that the European Union human rights law um, brings, and it's a case about which you be able to read probably um, in a couple of weeks' time. It was a case concerning uh, a proposed new act of our parliament. And the case was brought, actually, by two MPs, one Conservative, one Labour, David Davis and Tom Watson. And it was a, a Data Retention and, Tele and Information Protection Act, 2014, DRIPA. And what was at issue here, apart from the speed with which this Act was being forced through Parliament, is whether its um, imposition of rules about data protection pursuant to a particular case called Digital Rights of Ireland were within or outside the terms of the Charter. So that's very broadly the issue that was being dealt with. But what you may need to know and think about in the pub or elsewhere is, is what actually happened. First of all, it went to um, a divisional court in this country which said, well, um, we don't think that the European court's decision in... Uh, the Irish case, Digital Rights Ireland case, is correct, and uh, therefore we think that this um, bill going through Parliament should stand, but we will defer, we will, if necessary, refer to Europe. The Court of Appeal gave its judgment in November of last year, and that would have been of considerable comfort to the government, because it more or less supported the government, but again, they sent the case off to Europe, and Europe's going to be dealing with it, and they've accelerated the oral hearing to the 12th of April of this year. So, and that may come in before the revised, if it is revised, draft bill completes its passage through Parliament. Others may know more about that than, than I. But why this is important is because it shows the process of dialogue. What's presented as, you know, critically awful for all of us is that Europe's over there bashing us over the head. It's not like that at all. When there's a problem, the courts in this country if they see a problem, they say, we, we think it should be like this. Um, just as they did in that earlier case I, re um, I referred you to. They think it should be like this, but we realise this would put us in breach of that law, so let's send it over there for their opinion and see what happens. And so you're actually incorporating other minds, other brains and other experience in the decision-making process. And it's that that we have to consider when we consider whether human rights law and European law has anything to do with the decision of leaving uh, the European Union. But I'm afraid that that's not always the way it's presented, so that one political party last October uh, advanced some myths believed by others, saying that, um, first of all, it would scrap the Human Rights Act. Um, it said that human rights... Uh, decisions are binding. Well, they're not. It said that the courts can order, European courts can order changes to United Kingdom laws. Not really true. Um, and so this myth and these myths are being persisted in and we've really got to find a way of dealing with them. The biggest threat to parliamentary sovereignty 
um, probably is uh, the European Union's membership, not the uh, operation of the Human Rights Act. And if what happens in the event of there not being a departure from the European Union is that as a sort of um, sop to those opposed, the Human Rights Act that we have uh, is scrapped as has been promised. Rather odd things will follow as one commentator has suggested because the human rights processes actually tend to support sovereignty because remember um, uh, they bring home the issues that were otherwise being dealt with in Europe. So by scrapping it, you're reducing an aspect of sovereignty which is regarded by many exit campaigners as a critical issue for us to determine in June. Um, what uh, departure from Europe would mean is um, repeal of the European Communities Act of 1972, and it would not involve uh, withdrawing from the European Convention that would remain intact with the Council of Europe and the court, keeping an eye on our human rights performance. On the other hand, a vote for Brexit, if it does happen, and if that means that we will then be free of the much more powerful European Union Charter, we should at least have in mind that that Charter deals with rights that, although it overlaps the Convention, it also deals with a number of rights that are not necessarily in the Convention. Uh, for example, some <coughs> workers' rights might be affected because workers' rights on transfer of undertakings, for example, would be reduced. And there may be other rights that we would actually lose or our citizens would lose. It's not at all clear how things would work out in that event. How bad have human rights laws generally been, because people seem to like to complain about them the whole time, um, in, the, in, in the last few decades? There are loads of um, websites dealing with human rights issues and mostly obviously favouring the development of them. So I turned to one for their its list of the top five cases, the top five cases that have affected the way uh, England, or Great Britain rather, has developed. Not all European cases. And what did this particular organisation that you can find listed in the handout say were the most important five cases? Well, it thought the first case was um, the ca case of most importance, which was not a case where Europe specifically got involved, but was in 2001 following the 9-11, uh, uh, where under the European Convention of Human Rights, uh, you, you can make laws that violate those rights so long as they're strictly necessary. And this was where the Home Secretary took new powers to detain suspects indefinitely. And a number of them were in Belmarsh Jail and they complained. And it was our own House of Lords, as it then was, that ruled against it and said, no, you can't do that. We, we look around. You can't, you can't incarcerate people indefinitely without charge. Judges declared the law to be incompatible with the Human Rights Act, our own Human Rights Act, and that led to Parliament changing the law. So this is not a European um, influence human rights issue, but it's something that's the same as, very effectively, or similar to the sort of rights you'd find in Europe. And this is perhaps one of the most important examples as as Lord Hope said, of an independent judiciary holding a government to account, and that being a cardinal feature of a modern democratic state. And the other cases that this particular group identifies, as perhaps the most important since, uh, perhaps since the war, but since the last couple of decades, one was in respect of a journalist who was provided by the European Court with uh, the comfort of knowing that his £5,000 fine for refusing to answer a question put to him about his source was wrongly imposed. I hope he got his money back. Because they said, the court said, the importance of free expression is an essential building block of a democratic society. Preserve the journalist's right. Is that so bad? Does that make anybody feel particularly sick? Then there was number three in their reckoning of importance 
the, UN, the UK armed forces not allowing gay men and women to serve. And there was an English case where a judge, an English judge, was appalled at having to find in favour of the then existing ban on gay people in the armed forces. But the English test of irrationality was one he couldn't reach. He couldn't say, this is so bad as to be irrational. So the European court stepped in and said, well, enough's enough. And Jeanette and Graham's human rights have been abused, and that rule, that rule has got to be changed. And so it was changed. Is that such a bad thing? And then number four was the case of Dudgeon, the homosexual um, Northern Irish case that I've already referred to. And uh, I, I probably needn't deal with that anymore, but that was a, a case, of course, where an understanding of developing human rights around the world um, came to the rescue of the, the people in Northern Ireland, or certainly to the gay people in Northern Ireland. And it's interesting in the way these things work out that not only did that case, Dudgeon, set a landmark precedent for other gay rights cases around Europe, but it's actually now finding its way reflected in the changes of the law in the United States of America and referred to in their debate. Nothing wrong with lawyers looking around and taking opinions from each other or judges or maybe even leg surgeons. <coughs> um, and then the last case was the sad case of Diana Pretty, Diane Pretty, who wanted to be assisted in suicide. She was so ill. And in that particular case, she took her case to the European Court of Rights, and she lost, because at that stage, this is 1999, uh, the court concluded that none of her human rights had been unfairly restricted. They said that the right to life was not determined by the quality of life, and so it could not be interpreted as giving her a right to die. They said that her right to choose how to end her life did come within the scope of her right to respect for private life, but they said, nevertheless, the United Kingdom's decision to make assisted suicide illegal did have a legitimate object of trying to protect vulnerable people. But, of course, since then, there have been a number of cases, you've probably read about them, where the decision is inching away towards what Diane Petty would inevitably have preferred, even if, sadly, she had to die with that right of hers, not recognised if it is a right. Um, there's one other case I ought to summarise. You can see it in um, the handout. And it's a case called... No, before I come to that, I um, must just return you to the um, article by Sir Nicholas Bratzer. Um, the reason I urge you to read the article, if you want to do further research, is the article's quite short. It cites a great number of authorities, that is, cases... And it makes quite clear how the vast majority of references to European courts are rejected almost immediately because the United Kingdom actually has a very good human rights record judged from the European perspective. And indeed, how the United Kingdom has led the way, how it's done a lot for other countries. Do we really want to give that up? Do we want to give up some forms of moral leadership that we have? And there's one passage that he says this, the United Kingdom not only played a key role in creating the convention system, but its influence in bringing about effective human rights protection throughout the European continent has been incalculable. The Human Rights Act, the manner of its implementation by the judges, have set a shining example to other states of how convention rights can be brought home. The withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the convention would do untold damage to the system itself. It would also, in my view, do immeasurable harm to the standing of the United Kingdom within the wider community of Europe in which it plays such an important part. You, should we disregard his opinion? I don't think so. Should we encourage Russia and other countries where human rights are perhaps not so well regarded by walking away from a system to which we have both contributed and from which we have drawn wisdom and experience? Um, There's one other case I ought to refer to. Uh, it's a case called Horncastle. And in the handout, I've given you a summary from the Guardian newspaper, most of a summary from the Guardian newspaper, 
because it's a good and easy read, written by somebody called Joshua Rosenberg. Now, wouldn't it be nice if he could come and give a lecture here at Gresham? Well, he will. Um, but I'm not supposed to tell you that. But there we go. <laughs> now, Horncastle, uh, quite a complicated history, but get, I tell it to you for a particular reason, similar to the reason I mentioned in an earlier case. This was men who'd been convicted of crime on the basis of hearsay, to do with a written statement, doesn't matter, hearsay, hearsay not normally um, enough in itself, but the English law of 2003 set out the provisions whereby you can achieve a conviction if you're prosecuting on the basis of hearsay. Now, in Europe, the Human Rights Court there had delivered a couple of, uh, before this case, a judgment in al Kabaja and Tahiri. Um, they'd ruled that if a conviction is based solely or exclusively on statements that a defendant has received no opportunity of challenging, so that's hearsay, well then there's a breach of Article 6 and therefore the conviction would have to be set aside. Well, the case came on for appeal in this country and to try and take the matter in summary, um, the first Court of Appeal, very strong Court of Appeal, said, uh, no, we're right and you, Europe, are wrong. And so they then went on to the, House, the, the Supreme Court and another you know, full-size court, everybody there who could, um, gave a judgment which repeated, sorry, you, Europe, are wrong and we're right. It is proper and possible uh, under the provisions of our 2003 law to have convictions based on hearsay and just on hearsay. Indeed, the presiding judge of that court um, gave an example of a case where he could imagine how unfair, how unjust it would be for someone to be acquitted of a crime where it could quite properly be proved entirely on hearsay. But in each case, the courts, in polite with polite respect for the other courts with which they have to interact, referred the matter to Europe. And so, no doubt, you would expect that Europe said, no, 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 you've got to do what we say. No, they didn't. They considered it. And they have come to the conclusion, as you can see in Horncastle, that um, uh, they may have erred. And in any event, these two particular, or this particular case in England was correctly decided and that, yes, you could, in the particular circumstances of the English setting, with the English law uh, of 2003, yes, you could have convictions on the basis of hearsay, and therefore that the um, appeals by these men should not have been allowed. And so this is another example of the slow process of development of the law, um, respecting international standards, working with other courts, uh, not being intimidated by other courts, being prepared to stand up for your position when necessary, and the other courts themselves being mature enough and uh, able to recognise error when they see it. So, where does that leave us? Given the intention forged in 1948 to share decision-making with others through the Council of Europe, an exercise that has identified and reinforced rights through a court accessible to individuals as well as to other entities. Given the margin of appreciation of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, given the overlap between the provisions of the Convention and the Statute, or rather the Charter of the European Union, uh, that very rarely brings uh, judgments hostile to the United Kingdom, and where nearly all cases are dismissed at first reading. Why are we now being invited to revert to nation-state law on the basis that we always know best, that we cannot learn from foreigners, and that we no longer wish to colonise others with ideas in the way that we once thought was a terribly good thing to do? I, of course, express, and I have expressed, no view on the referendum itself. <laughs> Good gracious. 
But I doubt whether consideration of human rights law should play any part in what we may properly confine ourselves to deciding on fundamental issues of security and perhaps on issues of our economies. If, contrary to my cautious advice, you remain tempted to consider the human rights Brexit arguments, I would invite you to return in your imagination to that confused medical consultation and to forget the ear, nose and throat specialists and to focus on the men with the saw. Thank you. <laughs>